right, I think it's time to get started. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Tessa, and I'm the program manager for the Joseph Stern Center for Social Responsibility at the Marley Myers and JCC Manhattan. Um, thank you all so much for joining us for the first in an ongoing conversation series between the JCC Social Justice Activist and Residents, Ruth Messenger, and New York City Council Member Brad Lander. This is an incredibly challenging time, especially in New York City, and we're really grateful that all of you are tuning in and taking the time to learn and talk and take action with us. A few things before we get started. Today's session, we are welcoming Dr. Rachel Bedard, a physician who works on Rikers Island, which is currently experiencing a coronavirus outbreak. Um, and we're so grateful that she's able to take the time to talk with us. I know she's incredibly busy right now. Um, and if you have any questions for any of our panelists, please use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. I'll be looking through the questions and we're going to save them until the end of the session, but you can send them as they come up for you throughout the whole time. Um, and that's it. I turn it over to our panelists, Brad and Ruth. Um, hello, everyone. It's Ruth Messenger. Many of you I know. Some of you I'm privileged to actually teach and work with in person at the JCC. Some of you are students of mine at Hunter, but there are a lot of you on this call. So let me just say that the Stern Center for Social Responsibility, um, many of whose um, advisory council members are also on the call, got this idea of one of the virtual, not one of the many virtual things that the JCC wants to do is to put on a weekly program, Justice in Action, which will focus on one aspect of the virus, and that is all of the people who are particularly affected by the virus just in New York City. We're not looking at the country, we're not looking at the rest of the world, and actually we're not looking directly at issues that may be on the minds of many of you, which is um, you know, which of your restaurants are doing takeout and delivery. All of these things are important. But I've asked Brad Lander from the City Council um, to join me because he is an activist and an organizer by heart um, and by profession both. And what we want to do is focus on, over these next several weeks, different populations. I'll just read you a quick list, but the list is much broader than this, and you can make suggestions also. One group is simply the, the many, many, many people in our economy who are called gig workers or service workers. So the people who are only paid by what they do, and what they do is drive taxis or deliver food. Neither activity is happening right now. So what's happening to that vast universe of people? Another category there is laid off workers who have no um, employment protections or no sick leave. Um, and then we get to the people that you may have already thought about in these categories, the homeless in New York City, people who are already at risk of domestic abuse and child abuse who find themselves forced into a tiny living situation. And then for today, a particular focus on prisoners. There are other categories, and we will try to get to all of them. I want to say this is our inaugural call, and we are honored and delighted at how many of you signed on. Given that, we have a half an hour for today's call. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Brad in a minute. He will talk to you a little bit about um, the state of prisoners, and then we have such a special guest, we will spend time interviewing her and take your questions. We hope by the notice of next week's talk, we'll not only have a topic and a guest speaker, but that we will extend it to an hour because we're a little worried today that many of you may have questions and we may not get to all of them. We will try. We thought a half an hour might be the right time period for this program, but we now think that we need an hour. So starting next week, we'll expand. With, having said that, I wanna um, switch over to Brad and have him say some general things and tell us why he selected um, Rachel as our first guest. Thank you so much, Ruth, and thank you, Tess, for uh, hosting your first Zoom here as well. We're learning a lot of things at this time. Um, I was really glad when Ruth reached out to me about the idea of doing this weekly uh, series. First, just personally, I've been a huge fan of Ruth's actually since I was an undergraduate at the University of Chicago, where she was like the model of progressive social justice elected official. Um, and when I decided to run for city council, I reached out to her and said, how can you do it in a way that gets things done but really advances the values we care about of justice and equality and 
the work she actually did when she was in the council with Peter Vallone as speaker was a model for our setting up the Progressive Caucus. And actually we've now built a national organization called Local Progress uh, of progressive local elected officials all across the country. So I was excited at that level. Um, but I also think this approach is just really important because the ways that this pandemic are shining a, a spotlight on the gaps in our social safety net and the ways that we've allowed inequality to corrode the bonds of our society, um, that spotlight is being shined now. And it's not only that it reveals how far we are from the values we say we hold, though certainly it does that. It's also true at this moment that things, I think that we thought we could kind of keep away from ourselves we're seeing if we don't build a broad network of social solidarity and a real social safety net, it's gonna leak across those lines. You can't protect yourself from this virus just with your wealth or with prison walls or with other kinds of walls. And you know, those people that have been fighting for a long time for some kind of social democracy where everybody would have uh, the basics have sort of a positive saying that goes, um, when we all do better, we all do better. And I feel like this moment is like the dark inverse of that. When we sacrifice some people, when we allow some people to suffer, actually it can come back on all of us. And so we need to use this moment to really see that, focus on what that means in the crisis, but also understand the lens that's providing to us on what we haven't been doing uh, to build that more equal and humane and compassionate and just society and think about um, what that will look like if we want to get it better. So um, Brad, in thinking about- Brad, I just want to say that's beautiful. I want to say that off and on in my work in city government and in my work at American Jewish World Service, but dramatically at this moment, I think about this quote, and I don't want to be, I don't know, maudlin about it, but that I learned as a child that is purportedly Abraham Lincoln, who said, I wept because I had no shoes until I met a man who had no feet. Go ahead, sorry. So no, perfect. So, so for the first guest to try to do that, it was really clear to me who it should be. Uh, I first met uh, Dr. Rachel Bedard actually in the wake of the 2016 election. She was one of the people who had set up one of these local resistance group, an indivisible type group to fight back against the horrors of the Trump regime. And that was impressive and it's a great group that still is doing some things. But when I learned that like, that was her night work, and her day work was being a doctor on Rikers Island, I knew like, here is somebody who's living her values all the time. Because you know, if you go to medical school, there's a lot of things you could do that are easier, make you more money. Um, and you can still feel good about yourself because you're taking care of people than being a doctor at Rikers. And she's been doing that work a while. And so when she reached out to me two weeks ago to sort of sound the alarm bell and say, Brad, it is a, a, a gonna be a nightmare in here and we have to wake people up to what's going on and call for the changes to not bring more people in to get vulnerable people out soon, um, uh, you know, I felt compelled. And so she actually put up, she drafted this uh, letter, which I guess it's not surprising is her, although I haven't outed her before, uh, organized a letter with several of her colleagues inside Rikers and inside the New York City Health and Hospitals system, calling on all of us to take more dramatic action. This was even before the schools were closed. I mean, here we are two weeks later, and really only a pittance of that work has been done to protect her patients uh, and everybody else. So it's an honor, Rachel, to have you here. Thank you for joining. Um, I wonder if you could start, like before diving into the crisis, I think most people here, you're probably the first person they've seen on screen on Rikers before. So can you actually just take one step back and like, what's Rikers like? What's it like to be a doctor there? Uh, before this crisis, you know, what should we have been seeing that a lot of us weren't before? Yeah, can you all hear me? Can you hear yeah. me, Brad? Okay. Um, hi, everyone. Thanks for having me. So, um, as Brad said, I'm a doctor on Rikers. My training is in geriatric, so I've, I'm an internal medicine doctor, but my um, subspecialty fellowships are in geriatrics and palliative care. And I first came to work here at the end of 2016. Um, I wrote our now CMO, our now Chief Medical Officer, Ross McDonald, and said, uh, do you think you have an aging problem in the jail system? And he said, maybe, <laughs> we're not sure. And I said, could I come be a geriatrician there and find out? And he 
said yes. And so we think that I'm the first jail-based geriatrician in the country, which is a devastating job title because to think about what it means to take care of older people or people who have serious illness um, who are incarcerated, uh, it's very painful. So I had never been to Rikers until I took the job also. Um, and for people who have never visited or have spent any time here, it's uh, an island off of Astoria, and it's a little city unto itself. There are currently eight operational jails. We have a census now that has come down dramatically, even in the time that I've been here. Um, when I started, it was around 9,600 people detained a day, and we are now down to about 5,400, which has been um, the result of incredibly hard work towards the Close Rikers effort. And... Um, I had asked if there was an aging problem in Rikers, there absolutely is. So there's this phenomenon that we've observed sort of nationally where um, not only are prison populations aging, but jail populations are aging as well. Um, and so while all that decarceration work has happened in New York, we have been less successful at decarcerating older people for various reasons. And so now the population over 50 at Rikers represents almost 20% of our total um, daily census. And I run a team of people who um, provide clinical care for those folks, but who also do reentry work and court advocacy work. And we also handle all the compassionate release work. Yeah. Um, great. And I mean, maybe just, I don't know, one or two sentences more, uh, just on like what it's like out there, like Orient, <laughs> you know, I mean, I, I, mean, I know yeah. it's it's horrible. Um, it's um, it's horrible. So I think it's very hard if you've never um, spent time in a correctional facility to project into what it's like to be in a place where people have no freedom of movement at all. Um, when you come and work here, so just for me, not for someone who's detained, uh, I go through security checkpoints. Every time I go into a building, what I can bring in and out is obviously very restricted. And every time I move from any space in the building to another space, a gate has to be unlocked for me so that I can do that. Um, the physical plant of Rikers is just crumbling and uh, is an infrastructure that wasn't invested in for decades before this in a meaningful way. And with closed Rikers, the goal is not to improve the jails here, right? But it means that people are living in really um, dismal conditions a lot. Um, folks are ho housed in sort of two different types of housing, either cells, which are usually sort of long hallways with cells off of them, and then one small common area that everyone shares, uh, or dorm housing. And dorm housing is looks like barracks. It's like these big rooms with, you know, 30 or 40 beds, three or four feet apart from one another. And I think it's a common sort of misapprehension about jails, misconception, sorry, about jails, that people um, are here for a short while. But because of the enormous backlog in the New York courts, there are patients of mine who have been stuck at Rikers in the jail system in pretrial detention for years. Um, I've taken care of multiple patients who have been here for more than five years waiting for their cases to advance. And so... It's a place that was fundamentally designed to take care, uh, to accommodate people for short periods of time, but where people end up spending years of their lives. Um, on a good day, what people have access to is incredibly limited. There's a commissary where you can go get sort of junk food. Um, there's one phone in a dorm and you get a limited amount of phone time a day and people line up to use that to call their families. Um, there are some services that come on site like art therapy or uh, a live, you know, a rolling library. And it's really important, I think, to understand that in the current state of things, in an effort to minimize the number of people going in and out of the jails, those small, um, uh, those small sort of um, supports that are, have been available to people before are all, you know, be, have all been curtailed. And so, um, what you should be picturing now is men and women, mostly men, with nothing to do, who know that this virus is out there and who are just sort of stuck here, um, unable to leave with nothing coming in, no visitors, 
no librarians, no art therapy, right? Um, much more limited medical care, not going to court. Uh, they're really sort of sitting ducks. And just give us kind of the update where we yeah. are right now. I know we've been reading, but you know, just roughly. What, what's the impact of the virus already? What, what do you foresee happening? What, what is happening and what can people do about it? Yeah, so, <coughs> excuse me. Um, so when I first called Brad two weeks ago, we had no cases yet identified in the jail system, but we knew it was a matter of time. Um, Jails are not a fortress, they're part of the city. And so if a virus is out in the city, a virus is gonna come into the jails. Officers and health staff and others are on and off the island every day. And we had our first confirmed case uh, a week ago, which feels to me right now like a year ago. Um, and today, as of today, I think we have 73 confirmed cases, um, which has been a, you know, a rate of increase even faster than sort of the slope of the city's infection rate. Um, we have a few patients who've gone out to the hospitals. We um, are absolutely drowning, frankly, in trying to keep up with the number of patients who have had exposures or who are complaining of symptoms, where we are trying to do our best to, to separate out folks who are like, you know, who are likely to have um, COVID from those who aren't, knowing that actually there's no way to meaningfully separate people here. Um, uh, it's really chaotic. Um, staff are sick, and so our health staff are also um, working with sort of a skeleton crew. Officers are sick. Um, we uh, are already worrying about preserving our personal protective equipment, those things like masks and gloves and gowns. Um, and my colleagues and I sort of feel very strongly that the only meaningful thing that we can do to mitigate this crisis at all is to depopulate the jails as much as possible. So the solution here is decarceration. And that's not an ask we're making as abolitionists, it's an ask we're making as public health uh, officials. So we need to get people out of the jail systems, both for their protection and also for the protection of those who get left behind because the crowding here is the main issue, right? Um, if, we could, uh, if we could decrease the number of folks in a dorm, it doesn't just benefit those who got out, it benefits those who are left behind, and it also means that staff taking care of that dorm need to have fewer human contacts every day. Um, it helps mitigate virus spread a lot. And so that's what we've been pushing for sort of more and more vocally over the last two weeks, I think. Um, myself and my colleagues uh, have been much more outspoken than we have been in the past about um, uh, sort of the urgent need to decrease the population as much as possible. And the mayor has made some announcements on that, um, has made a commitment to decarcerate 300 or so people who have city sentences. That's folks who are serving less than a year for a misdemeanor or a violation they're serving all of that time in the jails and the mayor has the jurisdiction to be able to do that. Um, my team that normally works in compassionate releases has been working with attorneys to provide information to DAs in, um, as attorneys file bail applications on behalf of their patients who are at risk. And then sort of most critically, we and others have been pushing um, the state as hard as we can to consider releasing everybody who's being held on a technical parole violation. So that's seven or 800 people who are being held for things like missing a day of their program or not calling their parole officer. These are not people who are being held with new violent felony charges. Um, they should frankly never be in jail to begin with, but certainly in the middle of a pandemic, we should not be holding them here. And that's a state issue. That's, a, that's up to the governor, that's not up to the city. And I think that's one interesting thing. I mean, there, you know, we haven't made enough progress, but we did build some pressure on the mayor and, and yeah. 75 people have been released. Although really that's probably the numbers that would have been released in the normal course of business. There's at yeah. least 300 that he has said he's looking at. We haven't yet really gotten the governor to commit to anything. And the folks that are there on technical parole violations, those are all state, state parole violations. Right. And really what's, what, you know, the other thing, Brad, is we're talking about a scale of releases that's a little bit unprecedented, but 
it's what we need. So we need to get, you know, a thousand people out. We don't need to get 150 people out and we need to get a thousand people out today, this week. Like it, it really does, um, as we sort of see throughout the city, throughout the country, throughout the world, you know, every day or two days, infections uh, increase significantly. They double in the city right now every two days. It really matters that we not just do this and do this at scale, but that we do it quickly. I think it's worth letting people know that like New Jersey has already released over a thousand people. Los Angeles has released 1500 people from their jails. And in Iran, which is not usually where we compare ourselves to, they've let like 75,000 people out. Yeah, so, yeah. Um, you know, and we've- San got Francisco, Philly, all of those places. I also think that there's a, um, a philosophical question here that people have to address, which is, we have various reasons for putting people in prison or in jail. Many people, as Rachel has said, on Rikers have not been found guilty of a crime or are in for minor violations. But as a society, when we create a prison or a jail, the assumption is that we will not kill people by having them in that setting. And that's really the question right now, is that we are risking people's poor health, we are risking spreading um, um, a virus, and we are putting at risk, um, and Rachel, maybe just one more word about this, but it's helpful to remind people, I think, that we're putting at risk every staff person, including you, every staff person and correction officer who goes to work on Rikers every day. And if there's a ways to minimize those dangers, then we have an obligation to do that. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think a few things. So one thing is that uh, you said, Ruth, you know, we, we, when we put people in, we don't, we don't do that thinking that each one of those um, detentions is going to be a death sentence, right? But that calculation has really changed right now. We're talking about putting a lot of people at risk of becoming um, infected with a virus that we know uh, kills a not insignificant um, percentage of people who get it. Yeah. The other thing that I would say is that every time a patient here moves from one place to another place, they have to move with officers at their side. When they leave, when they leave here, they leave with cuffs on, right? We have to bring them their food on trays, give them their medicine in their hands. It's, there's a ton of excess human contact that happens in jail. And so it is not just our patients, although I'm absolutely most sort of heart-wrenchingly worried about our patients. Um, it, you're right, it's the staff, it's the officers, and then it's all of our families, right? We go home every night and bring right. it back to our communities. I, um... Brad, I know, maybe one thing to say, then I want to see if there are a couple of questions, and then we can stay on a little longer if people want to stay on with us. But Great. Yeah, I see this question from Elena Weissman about whether it's possible for people to be bailed out right now. I mean, would it be possible for folks on the call, the medically vulnerable people, who this group of people could pay to, to bail out, you know? Uh, yeah. 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 Um. Yes, yeah, so yes, bail bail is working the way it always works. In other words, the people who are being held in pretrial detention on bail um, can be bailed out. Um, the uh, sort of the mechanism by which to do that would be if you, you know, if you don't know someone personally who you wanna bail out, I think would be to try to coordinate that with public defender agencies who are advocating on behalf of their patients and could give uh, people ideas about how to, how to target those funds. Um, uh, so that that is certainly something to consider doing. Um, um, what, was there another? Sorry, maybe it was at the end of that question. Another, <laughs> more. another question that people are uh, that Sied Ali has, and and I think you and I can both speak to this one is uh, where will people go if they're released? There are probably folks there who don't don't have a stable home to go to, and and what would happen if they if they are released? And do they have to be quarantined when they get out? It's a practical question. Right. Okay. So a few things. The first thing is that um, many, many people who are being held in jail do have places to go. They have families that desperately want them home in the community. And it, this is a question that comes up a lot, and I understand why, but it is something of a misconception that everybody here is sort of going to be let out and be living on the streets. A lot of people have friends or family that they want, that desperately want them home. Um, for the segment of our population that would be homeless on release, the city is um, uh, very, has sort of very admirably stood up the ability to quarantine folks 
who have symptoms or who have been COVID positive um, on release in uh, buildings that they've designated. And um, for folks who are asymptomatic, they've also sort of come up with temporary transitional housing to keep those folks safe and off the streets during the pandemic. And that's sort of an amazing thing, frankly, because um, a huge part of my job uh, before the last two weeks has been trying to find housing for folks who are getting released. Um, and you know, finding resources for that has been really hard. But in the midst of this pandemic, um, the city's really stepped up to provide that. Um, and so it's, it's absolutely not a barrier to getting people released to wonder about what's gonna happen to them on the other side. Questions, Brad, that you see? I was gonna tell one quick story that actually I had shared with Rachel earlier because in addition Please to what's do. going on, in addition to what's going on uh, on Rikers and our city jails, our federal jails, you know, we've got two big federal detention facilities in New York City, the Metropolitan Detention Center in Sunset Park and the MCC in Lower Manhattan, where the same problems are taking place. And I heard uh, from a woman who has a sister who is 72 years old, currently being held at the MCC. She's actually sentenced. In that case, she's waiting. She was supposed to get transferred to another, you know, a federal facility. She got 33 months for mail fraud. And this woman said, you know, my sister is like, a, you know, she's got problems. And she did do this thing where she stole some money from people. But like she needs help and she does not need, I already thought not having 33 months in a federal prison was, was you know, but now giving her this death sentence as a 72 year old woman there, um, you know, it's just like, that's what we're talking about here. I mean, everybody in there, um, you know, it's a human being who, you know, like could be one of our family members. Um, and when, um, you know, that's not how we think about it usually, but, but these days, you know, I think with Rachel's help, we're, having it called very starkly to our attention. No, they're, yeah, they're I, I, I just would add to that, you know, that I have a patient right now in his 90s. I have multiple patients in their 80s. I have multiple patients in their 70s. I have patients who have significant dementia, who can't take care of themselves. I mean, there are people in here who are just inappropriate to be held in detention on a good day, let alone during a pandemic. That's fantastic. Brad, we have an official end to our half hour because I didn't plan for enough time. Um, um, I just got an email from a friend that even Oklahoma has released people from its jails. Um, so it'd be time for New York to catch up. Um, Brad, can you just um, commit people to a specific action that will send everybody who registered for this call? Yeah. And then I think we'll end this call, but we'll, you'll all get a notice of next week's call and it will go on longer and we'll have another focus. But meanwhile, keep your questions coming. Uh, yeah, so I guess uh, two things you could do right now and we'll email this to everybody who's on this call afterwards. One is like, you know, as much as I usually think social media activism isn't always the, the best way to do things, like at this moment, our leaders are seeing it. So I would just literally like on social media tweet at or if you're on Facebook tag, both the mayor and the governor with just your personal message of, you know, Governor Cuomo, Mayor de Blasio, it is a humanitarian crisis. Release people from Rikers Island right now. The power is in your hands to save lives. You can see things shifting. I mean, two weeks ago when Rachel raised this issue, nobody was paying attention to it. And yesterday there was an article by David Leonhard in the New York Times, just kind of like a moderate Democrat. He's not a radical saying, even though Governor Cuomo's done a lot of good things in this crisis, this is one really big failing. So let's keep the pressure up on both of them. And then there's also, because this is a JCC convening, um, some of you know that last year in Albany, very significant reforms to New York's bail process were won. So we don't have to send people to pretrial detention on Rikers um, by the thousands. Um, and there is an effort to roll that bail reform back. And the governor himself has expressed openness to rolling back bail reform, which if it had been rolled back right now, would mean even more people that were in there uh, with Rachel and, and her patients. So there is a, a actually, in this case, like a Jewish effort to say no bail rollbacks. It goes against our values and it is absolutely not you know, something we can do in this moment. So that's an email or a, and a letter for you guys to, to send to the legislature and the governor. And we'll put those out to you. Ruth, you're on mute. Okay, for those of you who are able to do this, a quick tweet um, out about the mayor and the governor spreading what you heard here to other people. But we will send you the specific link 
so you could be so you could be heard and sign on to a to a petition urging this kind of basically compassionate um, care and focus and release. Rachel, we cannot thank you enough for taking time from what must be always a demanding job and right now an almost impossible and job to help spread the information to all of to all of the people who are listening. There are 70 people right now on this call. There were a few more. And we will pick up with all of them and hopefully they will be helpful. Thank you all for having me. Thank you, Rachel. Bye. Bye. Do I hang up? Bye. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay, so we'll we will send everybody something and Brad, you and I will talk and figure out a topic for next week and run it longer so that more people can ask questions. Okay? That's great. Thank you, uh, Ruth. Thank you, Tess. Thanks everyone uh, who joined us. Thank you. Thank you so much.